Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, everybody's had a good lunch. <clears throat> I'd like to get started with the program and introduce our next speaker, who is Professor Mel Melvin Wilson of the University of Virginia. Mel received his PhD from the University of Illinois in clinical psychology and has an extensive background in academic research and training activities generally focused on understanding contextual processes and outcomes in family, families and children of color. His research interests encompass social concerns and developmental issues of low-income family life, including family structure function and context, family development and interaction and poverty and resource management. He has conducted, conducted analyses on young, low-income, unwed, and resident fathers and their involvement uh, with their children. Currently, Professor Wilson is collaborating on a federally funded preventative in, in, in intervention involving families and toddlers at risk related conduct disorders. And I think he'll tell us a bit about what he's learned in that. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, Mel. I want to outline uh, the, the talk for today. We're going to be talking about discrimination and how it impacts uh, parenting and family life, and also ways of ameliorating the effects of discrimination. But before even doing that, I want just to acknowledge that discrimination itself, especially as B.F. Skinner talked about it, uh, is more of a learning construct, learning concept. You know, uh, we see it in, <clears throat> in uh, beginning training of kids in kindergarten, first grade through, uh, and also, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so discrimination itself isn't an evil, uh, construct. It isn't something that uh, we should even think of as being entirely uh, 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 bad behavior. But how we've been exposed to it over uh, the gen over the past 100 years, you know, if we include slavery, uh, include all the um, um, impact that Europe's had on Africa and other parts of the world and also uh, what we've done with American Indians in this country. Uh, because it's become a construct that's purely uh, focused in, at least it seems to be purely focused in on one group of people putting down and affecting another group of pe people. And I just want to acknowledge that, that that's not necessarily the case. <clears throat> and um, what I want to talk about today, though, is the background of the role and importance of examining discrimination as it pertains to affecting the lives uh, of people who are different from another group of folks. I'm going to talk about uh, some background literature, uh, particularly that's focused on work with poor families, uh, present to you the design of the study, as well as discuss the findings in terms of uh, family confronting discrimination. And here you see all forms of uh, discrimination that may affect the lives of, of uh, people. Um, in particular, we're uh, concerned about uh, discrimination is dealing with race, gender, religion, income, and its extreme forms. And I do have to just add that uh, in the last four years, uh, not just in this country, but almost worldwide. I mean, the burning of churches in uh, Louisiana, uh, the uh, churches in uh, the church in uh, New Zealand. I mean, it's just this phenomenon of of folks going after each other uh, purely on the basis of race of what they understand as a threat to them. Furthermore, in a nationally represented study. Racial and socioeconomic discrimination, uh, discrimination, which I'm going to focus in today, <coughs> uh, has been found to be quite pervasive in our country. 
Um, that's from Rim, Amick, and Williams, 1999. So it's not just uh, something that's currently happening. It's been, uh, at least within the last 20 years, uh, starting to come back to fore in this country. Discrimination has been shown to be related to dis diminished, diminished psychological adjustment, uh, greater risk for substance use, personally experienced by adolescents when their caregivers experience discrimination. And those studies, uh, both in terms of Clark et al. 2004, Gibson 2010, Ford et al. Ford et al. in 2013. The present study contributes to the growing literature on the impact of caregiver discrimination um, on, excuse me, discriminated experiences on child behavior. Further, we will examine family processes that may attenuate the negative effects of discrimination, taking an ecological perspective. Discrimination may be the most impactful on child development via the process occurring at the level of the microsystem, as outlined by Brofenbrenner in uh, 1979. And I want to just uh, start out by saying that the study, uh, Early Steps Multi-Site Study, a Longitudinal Intervention uh, Project, which is a folk, which is, uh, involved three different uh, cities, Charlottesville, Virginia, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, and Eugene, uh, Oregon, has followed a targeted group of kids from the age of two to now, they're turning 18 at this point. Uh, but we've been following them for the past, uh, uh, have data on them for the past 14 years and uh, finalizing a, a group of data that's uh, representing their six, age 16. Uh, we're looking to get more, to continue with the study to age 21 because that I think uh, would uh, really just uh, cement are some of our findings, the sense of, I'm just going to tell you, uh, I'll just give away the uh, punchline, that the intervention we've been doing uh, has been effective in terms of strengthening the relationship between child and parent. And you'll see in this report that children, young adolescents, actually uh, can fend off any kind of just, uh, negative uh, environmental stuff that may come their way based on their positive relationship with their uh, families. So that's the punchline. <clears throat> families in this study are primarily from low-income backgrounds or from diverse racial and ethnic groups such as African Americans, European, and Hispanic Americans. And that's very, very important since in this country, the majority of people who are poor are white Americans, Hispa uh, black Americans uh, follow, and then um, Hispanic Americans. So it's important, at least to me, that we actually included all three of those uh, groups, and I think that was one of my many uh, contributions to our discussion, active discussion, when we were beginning this project. I guess I was the one who was saying, no, it just couldn't be about black people, it had to be about all poor people. Um, and I'm glad we did that. Our findings are unique in that they address the impact of racial and socioeconomic based discrimination experienced by their primary caregiver, most cases the mothers we're talking about here, uh, on child disruptive behavior in adolescents with a large, large sample of caregiver child dyads. We uh, started this study with about 731 uh, parent child dyads. Uh, in terms of adults, they're primarily the mothers uh, who are involved, some grandmothers, um, and also aunts and other uh, um, uh, female caregivers who uh, took the place of mothers. All families met the risk criteria by having socioeconomic family and our child risk factors for future behavior. That is, all our families were poor, um, our mothers uh, had to meet three different criteria: One of either having uh, given birth at teen, had uh, high uh, uh, depressive scores on the, um, our kids had high behavioral problems for acting out. Across the 20, 
across the two, three sites, 27% were African Americans, 50% in this study were European, biracials represented 30, 13% and 9% of other races. About 13% of our families were from Hispanic American uh, communities, and that included both the Eugene community as well as uh, in Virginia. Uh, in Pittsburgh, it was primarily black and white families. <clears throat> At age two, each family was randomly assigned to the intervention or control group, and there were home assessments conducted at age two, three, four, and five. Um, we had a, a year and a half uh, break in our uh, funding, and we picked up a seven point a seven and a half through uh, ten and a half. Another break in funding picked up at, 16 and six, at 14 and 16. And I say that only because you'll see that in uh, what I talk, present later, that we're going to be looking at uh, outcomes that are based on age three, age nine and a half, and 14 years of age. Our informants were primary caregivers, usually the mother or grandmother or some other important uh, female figure to the child. Alternate caregivers were often uh, fathers, and we did collect teacher reports, and at later ages we had uh, reports from the kids, uh, the young people themselves. Again, uh, our study is looking at discrimination, and for the discrimination variable here, we uh, used the microaggression scale, uh, which was adopted from uh, Walker et al. 2002. Uh, it is a nine-item measure that assesses the experience of ethnic, racial, and income discrimination, parents rated the frequency in specific situations that they face uh, between ages, their child ages of seven and a half and five and a half. Um, and the typical question that parents answer, uh, have you ever been treated? Have you ever ex uh, been expected to act in a stereotypic manner because of your ethnicity, race, and that was on a five-point scale. We had, uh, as I said, about nine of those kinds of questions, and they had a variety of situations. We also asked parents to complete the adult-child relationship scale, which asks if, uh, as an example of question, if the child is upset, does they seek comfort from you? As well as the uh, child behavior checklist, that was answered by mothers and fathers. Uh, if, and we asked children at the age of 14 to answer the uh, self-report delinquency questionnaire, uh, which is a 46 item uh, question about their own particular behaviors. Now in terms of covariates, intervention status uh, piece, uh, the uh, primary caregiver's gender, child's gender, uh, look, uh, age. Uh, we had the, uh, we asked parents to complete a form at, uh, at nine and a half on their ed child's education. Uh, we took also the uh, annual income from age nine and a half. So we had um, income, PC's education, PC's discrimination experiences, intervention status, uh, the site location that were listed, as well as uh, PC's discrimination at age nine and at uh, 14 and a half. Uh, we also looked at uh, discrimination times relationship. Now the first, you see that in this slide here, in terms of DC's, uh, target child's disruptive behavior at 14, that there is a significant relationship between uh, PC's report about the child's ag aggressive or uh, disruptive behaviors, AC's report, as well as TC's self-report about uh, behavior. So we had, we put together a, a, uh, a variable, a moderated variable that is considered um, that combine all three of those uh, uh, aggressive behaviors or disruptive behaviors for the TC. 
along the x or at least uh, x axis is uh, PC's uh, discrimination experiences. Along the y axis is um, TC's uh, disruptive behavior. And here, we're looking at the parent-child relationship. Does everybody see that? So we had a high um, parent-child relationship going along this axis. And that's being contrasted against uh, PC's disc uh, discrimination experiences. Or dis I'm sorry, disruptive behavior. So disruptive behaviors with TC or PC's uh, mother's perception of a child's behavior along this axis. And along this axis, we have a positive child uh, relationship. But what I want to now uh, focus in on are the dip distinctions between parent -child relation low parent-child relationship quality versus high quality relationship between parent and child. And along the axis is a per parent's perception of the child's disrupted behavior being contrasted with the parent-child uh, rela relationship. Along the, uh, as you follow uh, the line up at the bottom of the chart, we're looking at high quality parent-child relationship. Low quality parent-child relationship uh, is along this axis, and you, uh, you see the difference then is that disruptive behavior is coinciding with parent-child, low parent positive relationship between parent and child, as opposed to disruptive behavior being at low levels here and positive parent-child relationship. Mothers perceive discrimination having a low effect on the child. We're talking about mothers' experiences of discrimination at this point, and it's having um, improved. This is better. Let me just go here. Okay. In the context of high positive parent-child relationship quality, uh, perceiving the child's, the mother's perception of discrimination leads to low disruptive behavior on the ch uh, target child, as opposed to a poor relationship with the uh, mothers are experiencing um, discrimination within their uh, world and their context, and that is impacting their relationship with their uh, children as displayed uh, in these uh, charts. This study is consistent with what we know about parents' experiences of discrimination in late childhood and disruptive behavior in adolescence. It's uh, effect at least reduces the magnitude of, uh, of the context of a positive child relationship, of disruptive behaviors in the, uh, in the child. The attenuating effect of a positive parent-child relationship is consistent with previous research that suggests that a positive parent relationship is associated with fewer behavioral problems. Now, let me just talk to you, not look at this. Um, the point here is that parents are being affected by what goes on in the world in terms of their uh, interacting with others. Uh, how many of you have uh, the experience of walking through the store and having um, clerks follow you around, uh, clerks uh, uh, ask if they can help you, clerks or even the store owner come and ask if there's anything you want and really are trying to get you out of the store. I have a favorite store in my community um, that is the only outdoor store uh, in Charlottesville that I can buy the kinds of stuff I want. Uh, and all I have to do is open the door and a clerk is right there at my feet escorting me. In fact, I let them carry the stuff I want. 
uh, since they're going to help me. Uh, and there's no reason uh, for me. I've I always noticed that other people are coming in and they're not getting the kind of services that I have, have gotten. Uh, this is a consistent uh, thing that I, I experienced that I have going into this particular store uh, in Charlottesville. In fact, it's called the outdoor store um, in one of the malls. And if you ever want to come to Charlottesville, I'll, we can go together. Uh, we can, uh, I, I'm, I kid you not. Uh, the point, though, is that mothers are perceiving these similar kinds of experiences uh, in situations that they're involved with. And it's not because uh, the clerk, the owner, the store owner, or uh, even uh, some teachers who are uh, really not uh, concerned about what mothers, but they're more concerned about, uh, let me get rid of this person as quickly as possible, or let me not deal with them because they are not seen as people. That fact, that's the experience that I have. Uh, that I'm not a person, but I have money, and so uh, they want that. Um, children pick up on this in a way that is uh, important. Um, and you see here that disruptive behaviors uh, are attenuated if there's a positive relationship with the parent. If not, then uh, children are in the high spectrum of, of these uh, disruptive behavior. That's what this consistent finding here is. Now, what's important about this uh, for me is that um, parents are the ones who have to help their kids get through uh, their own childhood and make it successfully to adult situations. Poor parents are uh, wanting their kids to do correct behaviors. And typically the way that they uh, address that is to be very authoritarian with them, doing spanking, hollering, and telling them to be quiet, be good, and the like. What we've been trying to do is to teach and train mothers to be more, and fathers to be more positive about what they, how they engage their children and start that at an early age. We've, uh, we've worked, started with these families at two, and they're now uh, turning, uh, they're ter about to turn 18 at this point. Um, and they're well known to us, we to them. What's happened uh, in terms of outcomes is that we've been able to uh, help create a very positive relationship that kids can then emulate in terms of how they go approach uh, the, uh, the world in ways that uh, they're going to be listened to, they're going to be paid attention to, uh, and, <clears throat> and dealt with. Our kids have fewer behavioral problems. Not saying they have no behavioral problems, but they have fewer issues uh, with their teachers, with the other larger society than in, in we see in our control group. Though, I need to be careful because we don't have a um, uh, we have positive results here, but uh, they're not perfect results. The attenuating effect of uh, positive parent-child relationship is consistent with previous studies that indicate more positive parenting is associated with fewer problem behaviors. And that uh, is seen in the uh, later ages of life. I come from a poor background. I grew up in a place that doesn't exist anymore in St. Louis. Uh, it was a pruitt Igo project. It got so bad there that um, the federal government had to uh, close them down. It was the case that it wasn't the kids or the families in living in those projects that were causing problems with the, how the projects had attracted all folks from all around the city to come in and do what they wanted to do in terms of drugs, in terms of prostitution, uh, and the like. What was interesting to me is that the, uh, my graduating class from high school, uh, which was a, a low performance high school, was able to send maybe uh, 50 of us to different colleges 
and universities across the country, including the Harvards, the Cornells of the world, uh, and I ended up at uh, Illinois. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that from my family situation, uh, my relationship with my mother, grandmother, were quite positive. I had a nice disruption in living in St. Louis that my grandmother was so concerned about where I live. She shipped me off to uh, San Diego, California to live with my father for a year. At least I chose to live with him for a year because I missed the city. I missed my friends in St. Louis. Uh, I arrived back and I was still back on track in terms of what I was doing, but I figured out ways of not worrying them about me eventually ending up in some kind of uh, jail situation. My point is that the kids that we're working with are very sensitive to their parents. Our parents are very sensitive to uh, the situations that their kids are living, and they all are aware of this, uh, how they are segregated and uh, treated differently from uh, the rest of the uh, uh, community. These findings, I think, support that hypothesis that uh, we designed here, and they also support the experiences that I had uh, growing up in terms of uh, being able to secede and uh, get outside of, you know, beyond my own personal situation. I have extra time left, but I'm at the end of my talk, so I'm just gonna stop and open up for questions. So, so I have a question, <clears throat> Mel. Um, your study shows that there's an effect in adolescence, but not in early childhood. Uh, and it doesn't show any particular gender uh, difference, as I recall. So I'm wondering if you could uh, just speculate on why uh, you think that uh, there are or whether you think there are early causes to male violence and what they might be related to your topic. I do have to say that I think that both girls and boys can uh, misbehave in terms of violence. Though I do, I do acknowledge that uh, boys may be a little bit more rambunctious and acting out at younger ages. At older ages, I think boys, uh, teenage boys are getting in more trouble in terms of law and the like uh, than their, uh, um, than girls, but in some situations, particularly in low-income areas, I think you're going to find uh, both. There are going to be some um, acting out on the part of teenage girls as well, not to the extent that uh, boys have. I do think that one of the things that's happened, what what this study shows is that if we focus in on, on relationships between parents and child in the earlier ages, because remember now, our kids were identified as disruptive behaviors at two years old, which means that they were really hard to handle when they were two. Um, and those who were, uh, participated in the intervention uh, as opposed, you know, within our random control uh, trials, uh, those who participated in the intervention uh, had less acting out uh, disruptive behaviors at later ages. We didn't really look at, well, we did. It wasn't significant in this study, um, but at late, there, um, things kick in, in the sense of when you get older, you start to uh, calm, you start to, uh, behave in ways that are consistent with uh, the expectations of your parents. And in this instance, at age 14, um, uh, our kids were really starting to uh, do better in the sense of not um, being disruptive, not uh, being aggressive at all. I don't have a hypothesis as to why we didn't see the effect at age uh, nine. But it did, uh, we did uh, see it at 14. The parents throughout the study uh, were using the uh, uh, behavior modification procedures that they were trained to do when the kids were two uh, through five years old. And those things, those, that training, I think, 
really held forth and, uh, and worked. You know, I'm a believer that uh, what we did with the families were quite positive. Our families re uh, tell us all the time uh, as we're following with them that uh, they really have a wonderful relationship in their, uh, with their kids and within their families as a whole as a result of our participating with them. I'm not sure if that's getting at your question. You know, I don't see, though, that the, uh, that the level of, of acting out was uh, different between the boys and girls. In fact, our girls at the beginning, um, we were identifying more act, uh, disruptive girls than we were boys. I mean, slightly more disruptive girls than we were boys. Could I ask yeah. about... Um the ways in which you would assist parents. I know you said you taught them some behaviors with the kids. Okay. Was there a difference in the ways in which the parents would deal with the girls or the boys? And was there any instruction that you had about that? And were there ways that you help the parents deal with their own feelings about the discrimination that was going on on a continual basis. Okay. We didn't talk, uh, our interactions with the parents were really focused on the parent-child relationship. Uh, so we didn't ask them about uh, how uh, their sense of discrimination uh, affected their lives. We asked, we had them complete questionnaires, but we didn't have an opportunity to talk with them about uh, the specific discrimination experience. The, uh, our family checkup model uh, was begun with our families when the uh, child was two years old, and at um, the last, uh, the first five years of the uh, project, we were uh, doing regular visits with the families. We had parent consultants go in and talk with them on an annual basis, and that was based on what whether that the parent really wanted to uh, have a person come in and talk with them. Uh, it was one-on-one, one -on -one, or at least a parent consultant talking with the uh, uh, adults in the family, uh, more often the mothers, uh, sometimes grandmothers or aunts, uh, and working with them uh, in terms of how to use behavioral techniques, how to use uh, especially reinforcement strategies with the kids. It turned out that our families thought that if the child was uh, disrupted that you had to spank them, hit them, uh, and the like. Uh, and especially, and I need to add this to their defense, uh, if you're living in a dangerous area uh, of town, and I know where I grew up, uh, a, fam a parent trying to tell a child, come inside, it's getting uh, too noisy out there, or I see sirens going on. Uh, most parents didn't do that, that was calm. Most parents would scream out, I told you to get your butt in this house right now. Do you want me to come out there and grab you and pull you in, boy or girl? Uh, I mean, they, our parents were very authoritarian at the point that we were working with them. Uh, and it's only through the, uh, our years of showing them, actually demonstrating uh, individually with them how more effective uh, using these positive reinforcement techniques were in terms of controlling um, bad behaviors or disrupted behaviors. Uh, mm -hmm. What more is that our parents, um, both kids and parents alike, really started to enjoy each other uh, in the sense that uh, uh, even after we stopped the intervention portion, uh, we would come visit the families. We always uh, tape our interviews, and you could see uh, kids running up, hugging, uh, jumping in their mother's arms. I mean, teenage kids mm -hmm. uh, hugging and being, uh, displaying warm uh, interactions with their, uh, with their parents. So it was the matter that this particular intervention focused on increasing the positive quality of the relationship between the child and parent. And mm -hmm. children soon learned that uh, at teenage age, you're not dealing with timeouts anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure, quite sure I need to go back and look at the tapes to see actually when um, parents actually talked, uh, 
stop dealing with it because at, at some point kids would obey parents right away. Uh, mothers would mm -hmm. quietly ask the child to do something and a child would uh, comply. Uh, but I think it's, it is this issue of showing the parents how to have a positive relationship with the kid and that also being the way in which they could uh, uh, have the child demonstrate uh, correct and positive kinds of behaviors that really increase their uh, relationship with each other as, and also generalizing to having children in the community being representatives of their families in a more positive, positive way. Thank you. That was my next question was, <laughs> did it generalize in the community? And you just answered that. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Hello. Um, so I have a question about um, preparation for bias or the idea that if um, parents socialize their kids about um, understanding and expecting racism prior to it occurring, that it can help ameliorate some of the effects of discrimination. Um, and I was wondering how that might play into um, the findings that you found, and particularly if um, those healthy relationships can provide a context for that socialization around discrimination and preparation for bias. Okay. What I didn't present and talk about was the uh, videos, at least the uh, parent-child interactions that we had, um, in which uh, uh, parents actually talked about uh, some experiences of purchase that they had uh, experienced. Uh, it was done in a gentle way, in the sense that uh, mothers and fathers would generally say, uh, no, you don't do what they do. You uh, really work it through and just ignore them when you can, walk away, but don't uh, feed into the aggressive kinds of behaviors that they uh, uh, were doing. Um, the fact that uh, what was interesting about those uh, talk sessions were that uh, parents would actually ask kids to come up with alternatives to what was going on. If the child had experienced some kind of uh, discriminatory or some kind of behavior that they, didn't, they wanted to react to, children then had to resolve uh, with their parents in uh, discussions um, issues about uh, somebody picking on them uh, what they're supposed to do with that. Uh, teachers um, really ignoring them in the classroom uh, and how parents would then help the child by talking them through uh, possible solutions to uh, both uh, issues, both with uh, children and adults. Now, they never use the language uh, about discrimination. That's something that uh, I've used here. But if you look at those tapes, you see that what they were always dealing with were some kind of outrageous uh, uh, behavior on the part of another uh, outside adult, or some child picking on them or calling them uh, names and the like, and especially calling names. Uh, parents would help kids work through those kinds of situations by talking it through. And um, not so much uh, role playing, but just talking it through. And then at one occasion, parent, a mother uh, uh, had the child practice what they would do if that situation ha happened again. And I forget how the child resolved it, but he was able to verbalize in terms of uh, uh, resolving the situation. But that was just like one example. More times than not, parents would uh, walk, talk it through. And by say walk, you know, actually escort kids uh, part way to a, a, a troubled situation if the child wanted it. But more times than not, it was mainly just dealing with them in those uh, video uh, tape sessions that uh, they allowed us to, to take of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are easy questions. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi. I, I was wondering how we are conceptualizing uh, discriminatory behavior uh, in this context. Um, is, is there discrimination a definition to it? Saying, or? Discriminatory experiences. Yeah. That is being mistreated uh, publicly by uh, a person, if it's the parent, 
uh, them reporting on an incident about uh, whether it be a teacher, store clerk, more often uh, some public figure, uh, whether it's a uh, store clerk, teacher, and like uh, not uh, treating them with respect. Okay, uh, and uh, as a brief follow-up, I was wondering how we, talking about discrimination, how do you deal with sort of problematic behaviors when those problematic or sort of different types of treatment that the groups are receiving are based on some underlying reality? So I'll give, I give you a, 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 a reality. I'll give you an example. So from the Washington Post, there's an article, what's behind racial differences in restaurant tipping? So you have a stereotype among some people, oh, well, African Americans might be poor tippers in a restaurant, for example. So they did some research, and they found actually that the, uh, it does have a, a basis in reality, but there's a, there's a cultural perception issue. So the tips actually are, at least according to some of the research, they are lower. The, the servers are not hallucinating. Uh, it's based partly on reality. But part of the issue is that there's a difference within the groups of what constitutes an acceptable tip, for example. Uh, so there's, there's an intercultural issue. Uh, it's not necessarily because of disposable income, if I remember the article correctly. Um, so it, it has to do with uh, different, different ideas about what sort of constitutes an acceptable tip or, or what a cultural norm is. So I was wondering, especially in treatment of uh, adults in what would be perceived as just purely, uh, purely racist, uh, unreasonable behaviors, where those behaviors or differences of treatments have some basis in reality, I, very briefly, uh, and I'll throw it back to you, uh, another example would be, for example, uh, uh, robbery rates. So I was just brief, briefly looking at uh, crime uh, statistics on Wikipedia, and I think it was saying that the, the uh, arrest, I don't know about conviction, but uh, among the black population is something like 16 times the rate of the non-Hispanic uh, white population. So when there is some, it's not acceptable to, and I'm very sympathetic to treating everyone as individuals in a universal liberal sort of way, but when people's life experiences have a certain, there's a certain uh, spin on, on what they're experiencing personally, how do we foster some kind of intercultural or inter-ethnic dialogue to deal with that, not just from the perception, of, the perspective of how do we stop white racism, but how do we have a, a reasonable dialogue that goes in both directions about what sorts of behaviors are triggering reactions across the groups? Um, in terms of tipping, I think that uh, well, I can only talk from my experience. I'll just say I do double tipping, 20% uh, uh, always, or 25%. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the things that... Uh, you're, you're better than I am. <laughs> well, fine, but I think I, I have dated women who were uh, waitress, and they uh, told me what, was, uh, what their salaries are. So I'm aware of uh, what many of the uh, wait people get in terms of salaries. Now, that might be the point that... I think many people who are going to the uh, 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 restaurants and the like are unaware of, you know, it's not just a, a paycheck, but it might be a paycheck that's really uh, very, very low, and that most, of, most people, I think, are unaware of the salaries of, of wait people, uh, waiters, waitresses, and the like, or even the chefs at that point. I should have added another detail, which I think is important. Well, no, no, let me ask yeah. you a question. No, 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 Sorry. don't add, don't add. It's clear what you're asking me, so let me just respond sure. to you. Uh, now, talking about, uh, the, what I'm talking here is dealing with parents trying to train their kids how to relate to others in the, a larger world. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, that you don't go hit somebody if somebody is treating you in a discriminatory way. And some of our data uh, actually supports that that's, that's what's starting to happen, that kids are dealing with it in a verbal, constructive way in terms of how to handle themselves in public. You are asking me a question that's dealing with the, uh, the national situation. Like, you know, no, I don't defend Trump. I think Trump is a racist. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is our president. If he were to come here now, I would call him Mr. President. That's how I was trained to uh, deal with uh, uh, people, only because he's our president. No other reason. Uh, if that's what you're asking me, yeah, I'm just saying that parents are working with their kids in terms of how to present themselves in the world in a way that both respects them as well as help them get what they want 
in the real world. And that's what we uh, think that we're going to be seeing uh, for our kids if we're able to look at them at 18 uh, through 21. Yeah, the, the really, I mean, the really heartbreaking part for me when I was reading the article is that there is difference of treatment. I mean, there, there are differences of treatment. Uh, so, for example, some of the, the black Americans are experiencing worse uh, the quality of service in the restaurants. But the problem is that, that there's a negative dynamic where uh, the, the, the lack of intercultural understanding has created different forces on both sides. So it's set up a very negative dynamic where some people are actually receiving worse treatment, which they shouldn't, but the servers are not responding in it. They're not actually, uh, in some sense, although it's very harsh, they're not acting I in a way which is economically minutes, unreasonable. I want to hit this yeah. guy behind you, but let me just, answer, yeah. let me just answer your point. If it would be helpful if restaurants would put a sign out there to say uh, what was appropriate behavior, I would abide by it. I think a lot of other people would abide by it. But I do want to answer the guy's question right Thank you very much. Me. Thank you. Um, I was just curious, you know, thinking in terms of, like, family being there to help with uh, experience of oppression. And I know there's a, a bit of a difference between, um, like, suicidal ideation and the attempt for suicide between um, African-American community and the transgender community. And I'm wondering if uh, anybody's done any studies or if you know anything where in, you know, kiddos in the African-American community are accepted by mom and, and, and loved, but maybe in the transgender community, they're being rejected by family, and that's why that rate of suicidal ideation and suicide is higher. Uh, we have data on su uh, suicide uh, dialogy, uh, idea uh, ideation, and, but I don't have that uh, with me now. Uh, I can't answer your question at this point, uh, but there is a paper, I think, a couple of our uh, students are actually working on. We have a uh, paper, uh, about to uh, come out that's dealing with uh, suicide among ideation. Right. That's within our study, though. Um, mm -hmm. And that paper is, is, is being worked on as a draft of it uh, coming out. So I can't answer your, ge uh, your general question about that. But I can say that one of the things that we've been doing is working with uh, individual, uh, our individual families in terms of those kinds of issues. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, dealing with themselves and being more, you know, behaving or at least working in a proper way. I am going to wrap up now. They're telling me I need to get off the stage, and I'm going to do that right now. Uh, but thank you all for being patient. Thank you, Mel.